Welcome to this video, a new part, a new episode of Chess Giants, the series that shows great games from the past. This game is from 1973, <laughs> more than 40 years old. Um, it was played between Jan Timmern, the longtime Dutch number one, and Efim Geller. Yeah, Geller was one of the top um, players in the 19 late 50s, 60s, 70s, when um, he was uh, taking part in some of those um, world championship candidate tournaments and, and, and matches. He um, always was yeah, not far away from uh, getting to, uh, to, the, to the very top, but there was always one sort of obstacle in his way, yeah? like Spassky in top form or Korchnoi, or one of the other guys who just were a little bit better when it when it counted, but he was um, exceptionally strong, and um, it's very well known that he had a, a hugely positive score against Fischer, which uh, really uh, almost no other player could um, could equal. Yeah, let's have a look at this game, which shows um, Geller in full effect. D4, D5, and we get a queen's gambit declined with bishop e7. So a very solid opening that nowadays sometimes is um, considered a little bit boring, but um, Geller, after pioneering the King's Indian in the 50s, he switched back or he switched to those kind of very classical openings in the later stages of his career and he had excellent results with it and even he got lots of great attacking positions, which is quite remarkable. Let's see what happened exactly. The classical approach with bishop g5 here by Timon. Castles e3. And here Timon played b6. The Tartakova variation or Tartakova Makogonov Bondareski variation, the TMB. Um, this was the absolute main line of the time. Nowadays, um, there is quite a huge following also for knight e4, the, the very ancient Lasker variation, which nowadays is believed to give black quite good equalizing chances. b6 is more complex and more interesting than the Lasker. Um, there's a very interesting thing and uh, important to know. Geller, just one year before this game was played in 1972, was one of the main seconds of uh, then world champion Boris Spassky in the match of the, of the century in Reykjavik, Iceland, against Fischer. And uh, Spassky played the Tartakova in, um, in the very famous, uh, I think it was game six of the match. And we follow this game six. CD5, 95, takes, takes, takes here. Rook c1, bishop e6. That's important. Black takes the chance to put the bishop on e6, not on b7. e6 is the more active diagonal and it gives some additional options later. Queen a4 and c5. Black uses this b6 move as a preparation to play c5 and establish the very often called hanging pawns. If white now would take we actually would get this kind of structure immediately. Timon played queen a3, the main line of the time. Rook c8 to cover the c5 pawn. Yeah, and now Timon played bishop b5. Yeah, those of you who know the games of the Spassky-Fischer match might remember that this is exactly how Fischer played. In uh, this game six, bishop b5 was actually a novelty. It was a new move that uh, wasn't known at the time in, uh, in practical play. And um, the curious thing is that Spassky now, in the game played a6, after which Fischer captured. And now retreated back. It turned out that a6 was a weakening of the pawn structure. After knight d7, knight d4, Fischer had a very comfortable position and later won a great game after Spassky made some, some mistakes in the defense. The very 
interesting fact is though that the Soviet team led by um, led by Geller as the chief second they actually had anticipated the move bishop b5 for the match and they had an antidote ready but Spassky unfortunately for him forgot it yeah he actually had known of, uh, of this move and the Soviet team had invented the move queen b7 and prepared for the match but well as mentioned Spassky forgot forgot this idea it would have been very interesting to see how Fischer um, would have responded to the move because it now sets white a very difficult problem in the game now Timan took on c5 and well at first glance it's very hard to uh, to grasp what black is doing is he just giving up the pawn yeah in fact he is White can grab the pawn on c5. We look at this um, in the game. Yeah, Stimon played the most critical move. The question, however, is: Is this the best move? Hmm. <sighs> Probably not. The acceptance of the pawn leads to a very difficult play for White, and maybe the the best kind of continuation is something like castles. However, after that, it is not clear. What White has accomplished with this whole operation, yeah, putting this pressure here and then you don't take it. Black has a number of interesting uh, moves now. One being the move c4, attending a6, b5, which makes the whole kind of configuration look a little bit silly. Black gets uh, some nice play with his advanced pawns. Yeah, maybe, however, in a practical sense, it, it would be uh, the right decision would have been very interesting to see what Fischer would have played after Queen b7 but okay it didn't happen in the match maybe he would have taken the pawn as well I mean Fischer was a very principled player but this would have led to to very interesting complications as we see in the game yeah well Timon took the pawn recaptured and he grabbed on c5 at first glance if you look at this position you have a hard time to understand what the point of the pawn sacrifice is. To be honest, when I saw this um, for the first time, um, yeah, well, many years ago when I looked at this game for the first time, I wasn't really buying it, to be honest. I was thinking, oh, well, what is this? Yeah, I mean, I'm just one move away from castling, and if white castles, the whole thing is basically useless, yeah? We have a safe king, and we get an excellent post on d4 for the knight. However, all this is uh, like, yeah, very unconcrete. And there is a concrete thing going on. Black has the move knight a6. And this kind of thing, that concrete moves now, sad problems, is the, um, the real story of this, uh, this game and this, um, this um, phase right after the opening. Okay, the queen is attacked. What is White's reply? You cannot move the queen anywhere without blundering the bishop. Besides to c6, you can go to c6, that's possible. But uh, let's have a look. What happens after queen c6? Yeah, black has a, has a strong reply. He can trade. And then it's very important to play the right move. Rook b8 is by far the strongest. Rook c8 is less convincing as bishop a4 and bishop d1 kind of defends the whole thing. White really will quickly get in castles and bishop b3, for example, and consolidate matters. It's um, not as um, as dangerous. Also, there sometimes is a simple idea to return one pawn and get the knight here. Something like that, for example, is, uh, is just equal. In comparison, rook b8 here is stronger. Why exactly? It is very concrete again. If white now plays b3, securing the pawn, he has made a huge blunder because rook c8 is stronger now. There's rook c1 coming, winning the rook on h1. And white has no way to interpose as bishop a4 now is useless. There's the b3 pawn in the way. So rook c1 is just, just winning. Means that we will win the b2 pawn. And after something like castles, rook b2, Black's initiative, also connected with knight b4, will win him yet another pawn, and then it's even a pawn up for black. So queen c6 is uh, not helping at all. 
which means that there is only one move. We have to take the knight. Yeah, this is what Timon did. He took the knight. Queen takes. Yeah, and now we see the point, one point of the sacrifice. Black's queen is just in time on a6 to prevent castling. It's really a matter of one tempo. If white would have castles, everything's fine. He even would get a super great knight on d4. Yeah, but it's not happening. You cannot castle. White played queen a3. This is the best defense. And now again, Geller plays the absolute best move here. He can actually trade on a3 and play rook b8 for about equal play. But it is much stronger to play queen to c4. Keeping the queen on the sensitive diagonal and making sure that white still cannot castle. This is a very, very difficult position to play, especially considering that we are in a, in a practical game and we're not uh, yeah, at home yeah, sitting there and nowadays even with the computer who uh, tells us all the right stuff. Defending this over the board is really brutal. Yeah, mostly two moves come into consideration. Timon played king d2, a move that definitely comes into consideration. The idea is to play rook c1 and get the rook into play. The other move that I think was quite logical was queen c3. However, after that, black has a good reply. And again, it's a matter of precision. The best move here is clearly rook b8. A very strong move. The idea is we keep the position of the queen intact so white cannot castle. We threaten to take on c3 and play queen b1 check and we position the rook exactly on the right um, on the right um, open file so that we can enter on b2. For example after the capture we take with the pawn and this changes the pawn structure very much to black's favor as a capture of the b-pawn we give, give us a passer immediately. The relatively best defense here would have been b3, but after this, of course, black is just better. He's got the passed a pawn supported by a bishop, the long range piece. It is um, nothing that you really want to play. It's um, just better for black. Yeah, Tibbon played after queen c4, he played king d2 as mentioned. And here, again, we see um, how strong Geller is playing the, the whole game. Again, here, there is only one move that keeps the initiative going. Everything else passes over the, the whole course of the game um, to black, uh, to white, I'm sorry. Yeah, allowing stuff like rook c1 or knight d4 rook c1 later is, uh, is simply uh, not, not enough. Especially knight d4 is a problem, which sort of limits the, the black queen. The best move by far is the move played by Geller, queen g4. Just very strong. It attacks the pawn, just as that. And how is white going to defend it? You cannot give up the pawn. I mean, it totally screws up white's coordination if you give it up. For example, I mean, let's say rook c1, just uh, to... Look at it, we take and immediately attack those crucial spots on f2 and f3. And this is, of course, a deadly pin. Yeah, yeah. It is very uh, much clear that white only has one reply. He has to play, absolutely play, King uh, rook, uh, rook g1 is the only way to defend. Stuff like king e2, for example, where you sort of offer the e2 pawn, is not... Uh, um, punished by capturing the pawn, but with the introduction of a new attacking piece with rook c8. Yeah, note that the king on e2 is not allowing rook c1 anymore. And this is very, very strong. Yeah, there's also the additional idea to play d4 and bishop c4 check. This attack is decisive. The only way to put up some defense is really what Timon played after queen g4. He played the rook g1. Passive looking, but it is the only move that keeps the game going. And now, again, a series of super strong moves by Geller. Black now has only one move, again, 
to keep the whole thing going. And this is d4. Yeah, very, very strong. The, the breakthrough on this key square on d4. Yeah, what is the point? White can capture it with the pawn or with the knight. If white captures with the pawn, this has some very important consequences. Black now, all of a sudden, has got a great bishop. It's not limited by the d5 pawn anymore. And the bishop has various ideas. It can go to c4 at the right moment, or sometimes to d5, putting pressure here, oops, on f3, and still on this side of the board. And there is an additional idea. Sometimes there also is this check here. After the pawn has switched to the d4 square, there is this f4 square is available. Yeah, how, how can it continue? What is the concrete way to continue? Um, and this is a good move, for example, rook c8, getting the rook on the open foul. Very, very tough to defend. If um, white now plays, I mean, it's, it's difficult uh, to really give white um, any advice. If you play something like b3, for example, yeah, trying to prepare rook c1, let's say, um, black will have um, a decisive attack already. Check king d1 and bishop g4. Yeah, and you cannot defend this bishop takes f3 idea. Plus there is this, this threat. <laughs> um, it's a super strong attack that is um, basically not defendable. Yeah, knight takes d4 is better, what Timon played. And it's not that obvious, I think, uh, beforehand to see what black is doing now. What he's playing is simply queen h4. And this is a double attack on this pawn and this pawn. And if one of the pawns, um, yeah, fall, there is a direct attack on the rook and the pawn on g2. So the whole king side is crumbling. Note that the white queen is offside. Typical scenario. If the white queen, I mean, this is just fantasy, but would be, let's say, on the king side somewhere, there is no attack whatsoever. This is just possible because the queen is in a bad spot on a3 and black simply has the initiative with all of those moves queen g4 d4 just very very strong yeah now as mentioned those two pawns are hanging what is uh, what is it that white should do he played rook e1 which is a, a good defense um the alternative king e1 wasn't helping really um black has more than one good move now, but very strong is rook c8, intending rook c1, and after b3, again a very strong move, rook to c3. What is the big point? The point is that if white now takes, we have this very funny check due to this pin, and after a king move, rook takes, we have a decisive attack as black. Yeah? This is just like... <laughs> Would be quite okay if those uh, pieces would uh, would switch their places like a late castles, but this way um, this is not defendable at all. White, uh, if white snatches the pawn, there is queen e4 with a decisive attack. There's no defense here. King e1 is uh, not doing the trick. I think, relatively speaking, Timon's move is quite good. This rook e1 move. Yeah, here after rook e1, we come to the only situation where Geller is playing the second best move <laughs> in the whole game. Um, he now played queen takes f2, which is totally apparent yeah, and, uh, and obvious, this move. However, if we uh, look at this in, 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 in detail, and um, of course nowadays we can uh, check this with an engine, um, bishop c4 is even stronger, it seems, which prepares the capture. White really does not have any great reply to that. Um, he can try something like f3 and probably should try something like f3, after which the check and bishop f1 is better for black, but it's not an immediate win. Black is better, but it's not an immediate win. Still, this is a little bit more convincing than in the game. In the game, after the, the capture on f2, what... Uh, what uh, Geller played after rook e2, queen moves, and knight takes e6. It was helpful for white that the knight could actually take the bishop. 
the bishop was a strong attacking piece. And um, in general, of course, trades uh, very often favor the defender as there are less attacking pieces. It is quite surprising that after knight e6, fe and queen d6, there does not seem to be um, a winning attack for black anymore. It is, uh, I mean, it, he never had a winning attack, but he had a very, very dangerous attack. After bishop c4, I think black is better. But here it seems that while the position is super, super difficult to defend for white, <clears throat> from a purely objective point of view, or let's say from a mathematical point of view, um, the, the whole thing is, uh, is not, uh, not decisive at all. Um, practically speaking, this is a terrible position for white, but um, just from, from analytically, um, from an analytical point of view, it is not that clear. Black played king h8, which is good. Yeah, we want to get out of the check on e6 and now e4. Of course, white cannot play this or leave the d file because then the rook enters the whole scenario with the size of effect. e4 is just the best move. It also makes some room for the king. Rook c8 and king e3. That is the right, the right move. Yeah, getting the king out of it. Rook f8. Rook f8 is a strong move. I think the idea is to play queen g1 check, and then enter on f1, so that both pieces actually join the attack. White, however, now I think could have put up a very, very stern defense with the move e5, a move that he didn't play. After e5, it seems that. It seems that black is not uh, not winning or having an advantage. However, I must admit that um, my analysis is certainly not totally conclusive, as it all has uh, limits in, in terms of time that you that you can invest. Something like the check here, rook c8, is still looking very dangerous. But I mean, I and the computer couldn't find something decisive. Why sometimes? manages to, to get the king over to g2 to defend. Black still has an initiative in a way and is easier to play, but does not seem to be winning outright. e5 probably was the better defense, or not probably, quite surely the better defense, but it is very, very difficult to play. Playing with such a weak king is, is never much fun, and especially in a limited time situation in a practical game, um, terrible, terrible to play. Timon played the move rook d2. Rook d2. And now again, a strong move by Geller, keeping the initiative alive. He played the move e5. This is strong. Yeah, why exactly? It is strong because white cannot take the pawn. We would see this in the game. <laughs> he took it, which is a mistake. But uh, he cannot take the pawn, and it gives black additional ideas. It takes those two squares away, d4 and f4, and it gives those uh, ideas um, yeah, a little bit more bite. In general, Black uh, here needs to use um, yeah, all of his units to, uh, to, to, to keep the attack going. There are some very interesting lines that you can find if you uh, dig a little bit deeper. After e5, as mentioned, Timan took on e5, which turns out to be the decisive mistake. After that, black definitely wins, and Geller does an impeccable job of, of actually winning the game after that. Um, what else is there? I mean, let's say rook c2, yeah? White is just waiting. What is uh, a way for black forward? I know it looks terrible, like there should be some series of checks and, and then, yeah, winning. It's not there. It's really not there. If you find something conclusive, would be great. But I mean, Houdini, Stockfish, whatever, and me, we didn't find anything. But um, Black, in fact, has interesting ways forward. I was very much uh, fascinated by the fact that after Rook C2, the engines give A5 as the best move. At first, I couldn't really figure out what 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 is this move A5? What is it doing? In fact, it has a very nice idea. The idea is to push all the way to a3 and by dislodging this b2 pawn to gain new inroads into white's position. 
yeah ideas could be let's say when the rook has left the c file there could be rook c8 rook c3 looks a bit weird now yeah with the rook here but let, let's say just for example we, we do something like that and then this type of idea is very dangerous or rook b8 sometimes when the queen is not on d6 what you basically want open as much um, the position as possible and find new entry squares for the pieces it is quite funny that after a5 the comp wants to play a4 yeah to stop the pawn and then the the next suggestion is actually to go with the h pawn and try the same thing on the other side yeah trying to get rid of this g pawn and then ultimately invade on f3 that's really remarkable i mean it's it's a it's a well-known uh, fact that very often pushing the flank pawns can be an attacking device to gain uh, squares near the king but this is really a funny case with this uh, kind of simplified position where lots of uh, pieces are traded that you can actually play stuff like that even h5 in front of your own king but it is very very dangerous for white and and very tough to defend um, i couldn't really bring it to a conclusion like black wins or, or what or whatever it's probably better for black but hard to tell if he if he can win um definitely with e5 earlier there was a better defense for for timon but okay let's go back to the critical position after e5 he didn't uh, play one of the waiting moves like like a3 rook c2 or whatnot he played queen takes e5 and after that finally black has a winning position Geller played the check and now we see where the problem is. If king d3, there's a simple move rook d8. That's not possible. So there only is rook e2. And now after the check, king d3, the rook comes to the d file with decisive effect. The problem that we had all the time in the last couple of moves, that we couldn't get both pieces into the attack, now is, uh, is solved. Both rook and queen are in the attack. King c3. And now again... A good move rook uh, king d king king rook no queen queen d1 <laughs> queen d1 is the the best move now it attacks the rook and it prepares rook c8 when the king really has to go for a walk yeah there is no defense now white played queen to b5 check king c2 and now the final little stroke more than one way now to win but um, the solution played by Geller is very straightforward. He played the move a6, attacking the queen. And uh, well, the queen also has to take care of this uh, queen d3 thing. So um, something like, uh, let's say, queen b7. It's not possible. We just do this. And when this in queen d1 mate coming. So basically, white can only take it. There is nothing else. And uh, he played that after queen takes a6. There was only one more move in the game, queen c5 check, and here Timman resigned. After king b1, there is the direct mate, or alternatively here this check with a mate on b4 coming shortly. So a game that I always liked very much. It always fascinated me how Geller managed to keep this initiative going from a position where it seems that there's only like one move that white needs but he somehow never gets to it this uh, kind of uh, position here i really found fascinating because if you look at this after the trade it really looks like okay okay you cannot castle true but isn't this a very bad bishop yeah this bishop is just staring at his own pawn how is this going to participate in in the game in the attack and it was just so great to witness how the series of strong moves actually with the big point d4 managed to get everything into the attack yeah the bishop as well all of a sudden knight takes d4 and now after queen h4 rook e1 it would have been great if Geller actually would have found bishop c4 yeah, which is uh, keeping the bishop on the board as an attacking piece this is the only slight flaw in his play after queen takes f2 it seems that timan from a theoretical point of view um, could have defended 
But we shouldn't forget this is um, a game played by, by human beings where you um, shouldn't um, really take an evaluation of the computer of 000 as an indication that it is a simple draw. It isn't. White in this uh, game always had the more difficult uh, task to solve. Note that with this king, it's never fun, not at all. You're always walking a tightrope trying to defend against all attacking ideas that uh, that that get thrown get thrown at you. So um, yeah, I think from a practical point of view, this is a very very difficult position for for Timan to play, and ultimately he stumbled and um, and lost the game. Yeah, I hope you you like this. Um, if you um, enjoy this game by Geller, look at some more. He has played a ton of great games like this kind of um, a very logical attacking games which somehow sort of fit together very well and they're not uh, the kind of attacking games where there are bowls out of the blue or some let's say fishy sacrifice and somehow they're working it sort of um, makes uh, lots of sense what he's doing somehow of course there are defenses here and there but uh, he's um, very often manage to build up uh, pressure in a, in a very logical and, and sort of classical sort of way. Yeah, hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching.